بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان مبارك I pray that Allah accepts from all of us all good deeds and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to uh, benefit uh, from this Ramadan, sees this beautiful and wonderful opportunity and worship him and we ask him to make us from among those who uh, stand in prayer and fast for his sake and recite his words and to make us from among those who uh, end up among the, the winners at the end of, of this month. Um, inshallah here at Abu Hurairah we're going to have uh, three sessions every week and uh, when we were thinking about the topic or a specific topic for these this kind of series Ramadan series um, after some thought I decided to uh, do some readings uh, from a very very beautiful book it's not usually I'm not sure for some reason it has not I have not seen it i've not noticed that it's it's well known in the western world or among the english speaking muslims but in the arabic language the book is actually one of is like is more of a classic uh, and this book has a very like it has a story as to how it was uh, written or why it was written and it's by uh, the famous imam ibn qudama al-maqdisi abu muhammad uh, imam ahmed ibn qudama al-maqdisi He's a great Hanbali scholar. <clears throat> he was born in Nablus in Palestine. And as a child, then his family moved to Damascus. His uh, brother was a very, his father was a scholar. His older brother was a great scholar as well, who passed away before Ibn Qudama himself. He studied in uh, Baghdad for about four years, and that's where he got his like solid, profound scholarly grounding and then he returned to Damascus and became the imam of Damascus he became the the imam of the Hanbalis in, in Damascus and uh, the scholars hold him in high esteem he has he left a tremendous amount of books very profound books um, his book Al-Umda in Al-Fiqh uh, Al-Umda Fil-Fiqh which is a a very basic introductory but very solid uh, introductory work into the Hanbali fiqh and he also had the probably none other than the the book Al-Mughni the famous book of Al-Mughni Al-Izb bin Abd al-Salam one of the great Muslim scholars he said that uh, ما طابت نفسي بالفتوى إلا بعد أن اغتنيت نسختي من المغني. المغني is a is a encyclo encyclopedic work when it comes to uh, the fiqh and uh, again the Imam uh, Alhambal uh, sorry Ibn Qudam al Maqdisi is actually very well known for this. So I just wanna. Okay, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi that no one entered a sham or no scholar entered a sham who's more knowledgeable or uh, after al-Awza'i as al-Imam Ibn Qudama. There's many, many other, like other uh, beautiful quotes about him and uh, praise for him from great scholars. So he was a scholar of the top class. He was a scholar of the top class, rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, and he was known for his good character. So one of his characteristics was that he always smiled. All the time he smiled. He was a, of a very sweet character. They said even he got into debates and he would just smile all the time. And this gave him a great advantage. So he was known for that. So this was one thing. His company was beautiful. People who spent time with him just fell in love with his uh, beautiful, uh, with his beautiful uh, character. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy uh, upon him. 
Mehmet Ben Kodama died. I just want to make sure that I get the date right. Uh, <clears throat> let me see. I think I have it here. 600. Um, I think as far as I remember, 620. Yes, he actually died 620 exactly. And it was the day of Eid al Fitr. It was the first day of the month of Shawwal, straight after Ramadan, the day of Eid, he passed away and he was buried in uh, Mount Qasyon, which is obviously known in Damascus. Um, <clears throat> so I don't want to spend a lot of time just speaking about Ibn Qudama, although there's much to be said about him. May Allah have mercy upon him. He was upon, as I said, the Hanbali fiqh, school of thought, madhab. And uh, in terms of Aqidah, he was known for his, uh, again, uh, Salafi Aqidah, for his, um, his uh, again, he was, he was against what you, what you could, what we would call Tashbih, which is uh, uh, likening Allah or comparing Allah to his creation, which is on one extreme. On the other extreme, he was against, uh, again, uh, interpreting the literal meaning or the direct meaning of the of the texts, and especially specifically here speaking about the names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So he was upon the Salafi Athari Aqidah uh, in general. Uh, so what's the story of this book? And um, so I want to actually because Ibn Qudama himself in the introduction. He himself actually tells the story of this book. So I'm going to leave it for him. And, uh, and, and the way we will go with this book, inshallah ta'ala, is that I will be reading from the book uh, specific sections that I find to be most useful and most relevant. Uh, and they're very unusual. There's a lot of unusual things you will, you will notice, especially his advice, his practical advice is very unusual, but very helpful, extremely helpful. And this is a beautiful perspective that we lack in these days, that we really need. So this is why I thought it was, it was a suitable choice for this Ramadan. And it's, it's, again, it captures the spirit of Ramadan, the spirit of worship, because he talks about worship. And once we start talking about the story of the book, you will know, you know how this book actually can help us. Um, come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maybe inshallah make this a very good Ramadan. So he starts with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, which I'm going to skip because scholars love to do this in a very rhyming fashion. And sometimes, again, it's just we can summarize, summarize it in, in, in the sense that it's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, starting with his name and sending peace and, bl and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to get into his first statements afterwards. He says, وَبَعْدُ فَإِنِّي كُنْتُ وَقَفْتُ مَرَّةً عَلَى كِتَابٍ مِنْ هَاجِ الْقَاصِدِينَ لِشَيْخِ الْإِمَامِ الْعَالِمِ الْأَوْحَدْ جَمَالِ الدِّينِ إِبْنِ الْجَوْزِي Okay, so he says, I, in the past, I came across, or I saw the book, or I read the book, which is called مِنْ هَاجُ الْقَاصِدِينَ The Path of Those Who Are Seeking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by a sheikh, the great sheikh, the unique sheikh, Jamal al-Din Ibn al-Jawzi. Ibn al-Jawzi is a very famous Hanbali scholar. Obviously, he's known for many books. And he was a very prolific scholar. He wrote in so many sciences. Um, uh, one of his famous books is Al-Mawdu'at, the, the, the fabricated hadith. And it was, it was a turning point in his time because uh, a lot of fabricated and weak hadith, specifically fabricated hadiths, were circulated even among, unfortunately, learned people and scholars that would use them because they did not pay good attention to the science of hadith. So they would just take whatever hadith they were in the books and without scrutinizing them. So when Imam Ibn al-Jawzi was, was a muhaddith and was a faqih and was wild, someone a, a very good in reminders, and um, his works actually attest to this. So, and Ibn al-Jawzi is not Ibn al-Qayyim, okay? He's not Ibn al-Qayyim al jawzi Some people mix both. Ibn al-Qayyim came later on. Ibn al-Jawzi, you know, came before, came about 
probably around maybe 200 years, roughly 200 years before Ibn al-Qayyim. So it's important to differentiate between these two. Uh, <clears throat> for example, one of the famous books of, um, of Ibn al-Jawzi is Sayyid al-Khatir. You know, hunting, passing thoughts. And I said, this is a very literal translation. It's very beautiful, profound, and, and very, I say, sharp book. It, it shows you the intelligence of this man and the, the beautiful mind that he had. Um, so one of his books was Minhaj al Qasidin, the path of those who are seeking Allah. Qasid, the one who's searching, the one who is actually. Um, who has identified a goal or a destination and is walking or advancing towards this. This is Al-Qasid, so Qasidin is the plural. So those who are on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and thus the name of this uh, halaqa is actually the path. It's called the path. Uh, <clears throat> so he says, and by the way, Minhaj al-Qasidin by Ibn al-Jawzi is a summary, not a, and probably it's a summary and some sort of a, a purified, refined version of the Ibn uh, of Imam Al Ghazali's book, Ihya Ulum Al Din, okay, uh, which is a classic, very famous book, uh, huge work, um, very encyclopedic, and it shows the the depth and breadth of the knowledge of Al Ghazali, but also had a lot of points of criticism, a lot of serious flows that so Ibn al-Qayyim decided to refine it purify it and summarize it uh, so he he and the product was Minhaj al-Qasidin now Ibn al-Qudama actually came to the abridged version and he abridged it further and purified it further so he's going to tell us the story here so he says I came across the book of Minhaj al-Qasidin by Ibn al-Jawzi uh, I found it to be among the best books and the most beneficial. It has a lot, a lot of benefits and tips and, and practical, uh, practical points. It actually, like, it sort of secured a good place in my heart. So I sought to get a copy of the book and to read it. And when I uh, contemplated the book, I studied the book a second time as well. I found that the book is actually even greater or of more value than I recognized in the first time. But I found it to be a bit lengthy. فأحببت أن نعلق منه هذا المختصر الذي قد احتوى على أكثر مقاصده وأجل مهماته وفوائده. So I loved to uh, make an abridgment of the book, which would capture the majority, the vast majority of its intent and its points and benefits, um, and the most important ones. سوى ما ذكر في أوائله من مسائل ظاهرة تتعلق بالفروع with the exception of some the, the beginning of the book uh, that spoke about again the branches and these were specifically about fiqh rulings about specific rulings about acts of worship etc uh, فإن, فإنها مشهورة في كتب الفقه المستفيضة بين الناس إذ كان المقصود من الكتاب غير أيضا ذلك because these issues are very well known, very documented in the books of fiqh, and they are available. Everyone has access to those books of fiqh, so they can go to them. And these, again, detailed explanations about fiqhi jurisprudence matters, they were not the point behind the book in the first place. So again, I uh, you know, excluded them from my abridgment. And I did not commit to keeping the order of the topics or the benefits in the book or even preserving its very wordings. But I preserved the meaning uh, and I and my point was to make it as sh like shorter than the original. 
وربما ذكرت فيه حديثا أو شيئا يسيرا من غيره إن كان مناسبا له And sometimes I quote a hadith from myself like a hadith that is not in the original book or something else which is outside the book when I see it actually fits in that spot and Allah knows best Allah ta'ala a'la So he's telling us about his story with uh, the book but we, without referring so thus far to the book of Al-Ghazali, but he's going to make a reference to that. He says, وَأَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْكَرِيمَ أَنْ يَنْفَعْنَا بِهِ وَمَنْ قَرَأَهُ أَوْ سَمِعَهُ أَوْ نَظَرَ فِيهِ He says, and I ask Allah, the most generous, to benefit us from this book and benefit whoever reads it or hears it or looks into it. وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَهُ خَالِصًا لِوَجْهِهِ وَأَنْ يَخْتِمَ لَنَا بِخَيِّرٍ and, and I ask Allah to make it sincere, make it a work that is sincere for his face alone. And that's important. That was important. Because to write, to author a book is an act of worship, is a great deed if it's done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if it's not done for the sake of Allah, it becomes very problematic. So he says, And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a good end. وَيُوَفِّقَنَا لِمَا يَرْضَاهُ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْعَمَلِ وَالنِّيَّةِ وَأَنْ يُسَامِحَنَا فِي تَقْصِيرِنَا وَتَفْرِيرِنَا And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to what he loves, what he's pleased with, in terms of actions, in terms of speech, in terms of intentions. وَأَنْ يُسَامِحَنَا فِي تَقْصِيرِنَا وَتَفْرِيرِنَا And that Allah forgives our shortcomings and our flaws. وَلَا يَكِيلَنَا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِنَا طَرْفَ even for a blink of an eye, and not to leave us to any of his creation, Allah is sufficient for us and he is the best disposer of affairs. Then he says, another introduction here, He says, I've seen you, you sincere seeker of Allah, who has strong will and decisive decision, that you have uh, trained yourself, you have conditioned yourself to leave the unnecessary parts of this world, of this worldly life that, that is very distracted, distracted, that is distracting. And that you have decided to detach from this world as much as possible and connect and prepare yourself for the akhirah for the next life. Uh, being aware that mixing or too much mixing with humans, with people, it's going to again, you know, sort of affect the purity of your pursuit, compromise or dilute the, the, um, the yeah, the, your goal and your, your aspiration. وَإِهْمَالُ الْمُحَاسَبَةِ لِلنَّفْسِ أَصْلُ التفريط. And that neglecting to hold yourself accountable, you have come to know, to know this, that uh, neglecting uh, accountability, self-accountability and self-check uh, is actually the reason why uh, the affairs sort of get out of hand, Your, the affairs of a person get out of hand. وَأَنَّ الْعُمْرَ in lam yustadrak adrakahu al-fawt and that if a person does not take their life their lifespan their time here in this world seriously it, soon it would be lost and go to waste wa anna marahil al-anfas tusri'u bil-rakib ila manzil al-mawt and that the stages of breathing he's saying that breathing taking a breath in and out is actually these are stages of your trip of your of your journey in this life and they are uh, hastily taking you to the uh, stage or to the place of death meaning every second in your life leads you to death and you are looking for a book that you would take as a friend as a companion in you know this time of seclusion the time that you keep to yourself and that you seek the knowledge or the words or the speaking, the conversation of this book when you are in a state of silence. But I've, I notice that you are giving preference to the book of Ihya'u Ulum al which means reviving the sciences of the religion. 
وتزعم انفراده في جنسه and that you claim that this is one of its kind ونفاسته في نفسه and that it is uh, innately or intrinsically very precious and valuable book so he says فعلم أن في كتاب الإحياء آفات لا يعلمها إلا العلماء he says know that in the book of الإحياء which is إحياء علوم الدين بن الغزالي there are uh, آفات these are afat means flaws, um, and it also means ailments or diseases that are cannot be known except by scholars. And the least of these flaws are the uh, false ahadith or the fabricated ahadith uh, and the narrations that are ascribed to again companions or tabi'een that are not authentic but he referred them to the Prophet here he's giving an excuse to Imam al-Ghazali and he just he says al-Ghazali just collected these book, these hadith from the books and these narrations from the books not that he made them up but they were there in the books and he took them ولا ينبغي التعبد بحديث الموضوع and it is it should not like so they should or the hadith the fabricated hadith should not be used in worship or for worship والاغترار بلفظ مصنوع and you should not again be deceived or get carried away with a, a, a narration that is actually made up وكيف ارتضي لك ان تصلي صلوات الايام ولياليها وليس فيها كلمه قالها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم and how do you expect me to be pleased or to be happy or to accept for you that you pray the prayers of the days and the nights and in these prayers or about them there is not the words that were used or they were practiced by the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وكيف أوثر أن يطرق سمعك من كلام المتصوفة الذي جمعه وندب إلى العمل به ما لا حاصل له من الكلام في الفناء والبقاء. He says, and how do you expect me to really like prefer that you keep hearing these words from the متصوفة, some of the mystics that he al-Ghazali collected in his book and he recommended that you work upon them when there is actually no true benefit from them, like speaking about الفناء. And al-fana wal baqa. So here is the concept of al-fana specifically. Uh, so this is a spiritual state or a spiritual practice, and it's about losing completely, losing one's sense of self, losing perception of oneself and everything else, and that nothing remains in your perception or in your experience but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's pretty much something similar to what is being taught these days in uh, certain practices of meditation and awareness. Well, Amri bishiddatil jua and recommending, you know, starvation, that you actually starve yourself as a form of purification, spiritual purification and worship. And this is not fasting. This is just, you know, long-term starvation for spiritual reasons. And that you travel around and you leave your home or country without proper, without a genuine need, just as a spiritual practice. And to go into, for example, like a desert or an open land where there is no connections, there's no facilities, there's no people. You go there without proper food you, you don't take the food that you need and again this was a practice of that i trust allah so i'm just going to throw myself i'm just going to travel through the desert or go into this terrain where there's no people there's no towns no cities no humans no food nothing because i trust allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this was some sort of a practice by some mystics إلى غير ذلك مما قد كشف كشفت عن عواره في كتابي المسمى تلبيس ابليس and other practices or other things that I exposed in my book, which is called Talbisu Iblis. That's another famous book by uh, Ibn al-Jawzi. So sorry, this was actually, this was the introduction of Ibn al-Jawzi. Ibn al-Jawzi, 
this was his introduction on his book, Minhaj al Qasidin, and he's explaining why he summarized the book of Al Ghazali. And obviously, Ibn al Jawzi has this famous book, Talbis Iblis, one of his most famous books about the deception of Shaytan and the ways Shaytan deceives, specifically worshippers and good people. I'll just need to plug the laptop before I lose power. So bear with me, please. Yeah, Bismillah. I hope we're good now. Yes, Bismillah. So this was again Ibn al Jawzi speaking. So we have three levels. First, the book of Hiya Ulum al Din by Al Ghazali, which was abridged and summarized and purified by Ibn al Jawzi because he criticized, he had like genuine concerns about the book. And then the summary by Ibn al-Jawzi was also summarized and refined by Ibn Qudama. So we're going to deal with the third one in this series, inshallah. But this is just the introduction from Ibn al-Jawzi. He says, um, So he says, and I'm going to write a book for you that is void of all of these flaws and issues. And it captures the same benefits. So it has holds the same value because he recognizes there is a, there's good stuff in the book, but there are flaws. So he says, I'm gonna take out the flaws and offer you something that still retains the value and the benefits of the book. And I depend on the narrations or I utilize the narrations that are uh, most authentic and that are well known. And among the meanings, I choose the ones that are most correct and the best, even the best quality of meanings. And I would remove or discard whatever, you know, is, is is better to not be there, not to be there. And I would add for myself what I see to be beneficial or to fit in that place. Again, then he said afterwards, this is again Ibn al-Jawzi speaking still. And he says, and since your intention or your determination to, again, seclude yourself um, and not mix, again, more than necessary with people. This, because this is the word uzla among the scholars. So that you can derive the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's al-haq, from your nafs, from yourself. So you want to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his rights, his rights upon you. And that you want to hold yourself accountable and put it in its right place. Let your deputy or let your assistant be there. Or the tool, if you like, a very loose translation. Let that be knowledge. Again, it's important. If you want to worship, you need knowledge. That's this is how the scholars and how the worshippers really proper worshippers approached the whole concept of worship, spiritual development, and devotion and matters of the heart. That the most the most central tool that you have or methodology is knowledge, because without knowledge, there's a lot of problems. And be you know, search carefully, inspect. 
even the most minute or what seems to be the smallest of your desires and the flaws of your nafs. You need to be, you need to go into details when it comes to treating the ailments of yourself. Hopefully you would be safe from its evils. And you know, make sure you avoid uh, these two paths or these two examples of people. Okay, so, so he's mentioning two examples of people that should be avoided. This is again still Ibn al-Jawzi speaking. He says an, a knowledgeable person that has mastered debates, discussion, principles, even in fiqh, and he's content with himself being in this position of authority, that he's become an authority, he's a, he's a leader, he's expert, top expert. Okay, so this person is content with that status that he has arrived at based on his knowledge of fiqh and his capacity for debate and for, again, his eloquence. Or um, he reached a high level in terms, uh, in the position of a judge and he's obviously, he's occupying this high status in the society or even in the government, or someone who has become very well-spoken and soft-spoken in terms of reminders. So he's, a, again, like the famous da'iyas today that are very attractive, uh, very eloquent, and they mesmerize people with their speech. And uh, for him, that's it. That's the point. Like, that's the... That's the ultimate goal. So it's basically position, uh, some success in what you do, whether it's knowledge or it's reminders or it's uh, you know the position of being a judge. So this is the first example that he warns against. The second example, uh, the second type of uh, uh, example that he warns against is that a person who seems to be a worshipper, leaving this dunya, etc., leaving the path of mysticism, uh, but again, he's moving here and there based on his ignorance. His opinion is based on ignorance. There's no knowledge. It's not based on knowledge. It's just, you know, whatever he has learned or picked up from here or there, whatever he feels good, Etc. whatever he likes. And again, he's, again, this means he's basically, he seeks nearness or he seeks, uh, again, advancement with kissing hands. So it's either he is kissing the hands of his teachers or his superiors in this path, his masters, right? So he's seeking advancement in this path by pleasing or by being very appeasing to the masters or he himself has reached a high level in this let's say mystic order and he's just enjoying you know his followers giving him this high status and that they all seek to please him he's like his pleasure becoming it becomes an end in itself and again believing in the innate blessings and value of either himself or his master, right? And he's working based on, again, what he likes, what he feels, his desires, but not on the legisl legislation uh, from Allah and the path of the Prophet So he says, He says, these two people have taken a path other than the path of correctness. These people are so content with the appearance of things, but not the reality, not the essence of, of this path. So they just hold on to the formalities, the folklore, the artifacts of this, but not the real essence. And they are deceiving. These two examples are deceiving beginners who are getting into this path or trying to practice Islam with very glittery 
kind of mirage. They're giving them a, an illusion. It's not a real thing. And their path is a way is different from the path of the early generations, which is actually the right and correct path, and the way of safety. And I will include in this book, inshallah. Uh, narrations or stories from the early generations that will point to their real path and their real practice. This book of ours is needed by those in an advanced state and, and also it is beneficial or the beginner needs it, needs it as well, needs this book. Because we mention in it the secrets of uh, acts of worship والتحذير, والتحذير and warning against the flaws the pitfalls you know of again treading the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the author have made it or made it into four sections he's referring here because this classification these four sections are actually from Ihya Ulum al-Din the book of Al-Ghazali the first section is the quarter of worship or acts of worship. The second section is the quarter on uh, habits or practices or dealings. And the third section or quarter is on the pitfalls or the dangers that destroy your religion or destroy your heart. The fourth section or quarter is on uh, these things that can save you. Things that can save you on this path. Okay, and he says each one of those sections includes uh, small, smaller sections, subsections, and um, Again, titles, headings, etc. So he starts with the first. He starts with the first section, which is Rubu al ibadat So, okay, I think this is. So we're going to start, inshallah. Maybe I think that's enough for today as an introduction. I don't want it to be too long. Um, we're going to start with the section of uh, the acts of worship or worship itself and the concept of worship. And uh, again, as I said, we will be very selective. Uh, we'll, we'll try to ch choose the, the parts or the segments and the paragraph and paragraphs and sections that are, are, at least in my personal estimate, that are most beneficial and relevant to our times and to, uh, again, our attempts to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and grow spiritually. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So again, I would say uh, Ramadan Mubarak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. May Allah guide us and help us to fast in a way that pleases him for his own sake with sincerity and to worship him, to recite the Quran and do dhikr and to stand up uh, at night in prayer and to please him and to stay away from sin. And I know these are tough times, um, a lot of restrictions for praying at the masajid, etc. Uh, but again, you know, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless. Uh, whether we are with people or we are alone, whether the masajid are open or they're closed, whether there's a lockdown or we are able to get together to worship, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with whatever he makes available to us. Uh, that's very important to keep in mind. And Allah does not require from us more than what we can do. So whatever is available to us, we seize that, we do it, and we try to Again, enjoy these acts of worship because enjoying these acts of worship actually makes them more sustainable. So these are blessed nights, important times. We should not miss out on. So I encourage each one of you to do your best and feel the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure you're doing these things not for your own pleasure, but that you're doing them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah loves that you worship him. Because this is how this is why he 
created us. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all tawfiq and guidance in doing all of that. And inshallah, see you in a um, see you Thursday, yes, in a couple of days, inshallah, with uh, halaqa number two as we continue with the book of Ibn Qudam al Maqdisi, rahimahullah ta'ala, which is called Muhtasaru Minhaj al Qasidin, which is basically an abridgment of the path, the path of the seekers. And hence, this halaqa is called the path. And I uh, pray, inshallah, that you will find it beneficial and helpful as you are uh, seeking to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.